Welcome those of you who are in the room and welcome those of you who are out, out in cyberspace. Welcome to Community Church of Boston, a peace and justice congregation since 1920. Um, March 24th is the day that we remember Monsignor Romero. He is in the poster, El Salvador's martyr hero, um, who spoke truth to power and said, I beseech you, I, I ask you, I command you, in the name of God, cease the repression. Thou shalt not kill, is it, it is a commandment from the law of God. This afternoon we will be uh, hosting a whole mess of Salvadorans right here in this room and enjoying a lot of uh, delicacies from said country. Our cook is from El Salvador and uh, both uh, Jose Aleman, who is uh, one of our officers and used to be the uh, Consul General of El Salvador, and I have lots of contacts from El Salvador here in Boston, so it should be a joyous occasion. I hope you will join us at, at 1 p.m. Those of you who are here get to enjoy it as our luncheon after church, and those of you who want to come in, um, it should be a really wonderful moment remembering Monsignor Oscar Romero. Um, we also remember some other martyrs, Aaron Bushnell. This beautiful poster was brought to us by Dan the Bagel Man Kantoff, and we remember Aaron Bushnell. And of course, it's almost Easter time, so we remember Jesus. Um, and this, this, this painting is a Pieta, but it's in um, a Palestinian Jesus, who was a Palestinian, by the way, and he has a kafia, and his, and his mother is wearing a hijab. And it speaks a lot. This painting is by our friend Katie Elal, Miranda Elal uh, from California. Um, and we want to put a, put a, a, a sort of, um, uh, speed up uh, spring here. Springs, uh, springs in like a lion is uh, is hanging out way too much in in Boston. We had just huge rain last night, and and it's just been quite cold. So I want to uh, share with you to start out, um, and first light this candle, which we always do. If I stood out in the rain night. My only light a candle a million miles away. Will you lay down your fire as I raised mine? Will you not kill again? And oh, when you're near me, oh, my love, oh, my joy, there's nothing ever to weary me, oh, my darling one. And the reading that I found and transcribed is something that... Helen Keller uh, shared with us in 1932, on March 26, 1932. She was not able to be here in person because she was ill and could not travel uh, to, to make the gig, but um, she, she sent this, this statement or this, these re reflections, which were read in Symphony Hall, which is where Community Church met at that time, and had um, thousands of, uh, of um, people in the audience. It was a remarkable history to this place. But this is what she asked to be read by a certain Richard C. Cabot. Dear friends, today our Lord rises in every heart with renewal and gladness in both hands, and everywhere sings resurrection both from within and without. Again, the life essence flows through the world, awakening the earth to verdure, buds, and fragrance. It flows into every seed, every root, every leaf, every beam of light. It has flowed thus into all things since creation. Yet God's works are forever new and forever beautiful. This is a parable for us. When we complain of having to do the same thing over and over, let us remember that God does not send new trees, strange flowers, and different grasses every year. When the spring winds blow, they blow in the same way. In the same places, the same dear blossoms lift up the same sweet faces. 
yet they never weary us. When it rains, it rains as it always has, even so with the same tasks which fill our daily lives, put out new me meanings if we wrought them in the spirit of renewal from within, a spirit of growth and beauty. It is not required of every man and woman to do or be something great. Most of us have to be content to take small parts in the drama of life. Shall we have no more little songs, soft lullabies, dainty lyrics, because Homer, Dante, and Shakespeare wrote grand epics and dramas, and because we have heard a thousand larks shouting, Good morrow to the sun, shall the tiny trill of the song sparrow please us no more? What God asks of us is to perform our simple tasks with fresh emotions and new aspirations. This is the resurrection, the way and the life in this world or any other world. We were not created, some of us to labor, suffer and want, the rest of us to get and spend and waste the works of man's hands. We were created to all belong to each other, to increase with our work the comforts, the knowledge, the joy in the world. That will be our highest resurrection when we rise out of selfish and separate interests into sympathy and mutual aid, out of wars and jealous fears into peace, out of the limits of nationalism, class, and creed into the boundless life of the race, out of materialism into the kingdom of God. Again, Helen Keller, as you know, deaf and blind, uh, but taught by Ann Sullivan and became um, a major uh, force for the, the rights of disabled people as well as, as a serious um, socialist uh, in her day, which, which was, I don't remember exactly her dates, but that was fairly near the end of her life, 1932. Um, and we found this in, a, a, um, in our archives. So... We welcome you, and we welcome, as uh, for our musical selections today, someone we know very well, a member of our church, and also um, we we get to hear her practice a lot here at, in in our our own auditorium. Um, Beatrice Green, pianist and composer, thank you so much for joining us this morning.
Thank you, Beatrice. That's beautiful. Um, and we'll hear more from Beatrice uh, in a little bit. Um, I have announcements, but I can't help but tell you about what happened in this room last night. There was an iftar that's um, brought to us by Muslims for Progressive Values, a uh, nationwide organization who has a Boston chapter who meets here regularly. And um, it, it was, I was not here, but it was a supposedly a really beautiful event and they had a good time uh, based on how, how many bags of trash they left. Um, very neatly, thank you. And that's, that's how we know it was, it was a lovely event. Uh, but mostly what I wanna tell you about is next, next weekend. We have a busy weekend. Friday night is the David Rovix concert. And if you have not heard David, you, you must come. Every time he is anywhere near Boston, we drop everything and host him. He's been here many times. People's troubadour travels far and wide, um, and his, his tour, his concerts are called Notes from a Holocaust, and he's written, written um, deeply and seriously about the ongoing genocide in, in Gaza. And he will have um, new songs. He always is composing and, and writing songs uh, of incredible import to our world situation right now. Um, 31st, our speaker uh, on that Sunday is named Audrey Shulman. Audrey has worked hard with us on this five-story uh, commercial building that we own here on um, making it greener and and making it uh, uh, and achieving our goal, which is making it a model for energy efficiency and sustainability for buildings of a similar size and nature, of which there are twenty thousand in the city of Boston, and we've we've achieved some some really great goals. We have all new HVAC in the entire building, thanks to some grants. We have a new roof which we, we, should, we should have a ceremony just to celebrate that there's a new roof on this auditorium um, and we won't have any more leaks. <laughs> um, but I'm looking up at the skylight that has, has new roof and new insulation all around it and we have other, other big goals for the facade and for other, other parts of, of the building as well. Audrey Shulman uh, leads a group called HEAT, H-E-E-T, and they're working on installing what's called microgrids, which, which is a cooperative venture of, let's say, a street, let's say uh, the 40 houses, and they cooperate with the utility to um, install geothermal energy whose uh, lines beneath the ground are right in the, in the street, right, uh, right down your street, and um, everybody, cooperates and, and, and you have like um, community heat and air conditioning uh, for the cost of, after the initial cost for the cost of like running a refrigerator, geothermal energy. That's what Audrey will be talking about. She's done just wonderful work in the city of Boston. Um, 
And on Monday night, April 1st, I hope you will join us for a really wonderful event. It's not usual that we do with something like this on a Monday, but it's April Fool's Day, and that is our highest of high holidays here at uh, Community Church of Boston. Um, and, and we like to do comedy that night. And Billy, the Jimmy Tingle is a legendary Boston comedian and has offered his services um, for a benefit for community church. We, we are in dire um, economic straits right at this very juncture because of our first floor, which is a restaurant lease, uh, and it's been vacant. Uh, and he will, he will do not only a, a comedy show, but it's also a, uh, a celebration of Dick Kashishin, who was our um, um, clerk for 20 years. He is 89 years old. He will be with us, and we will be um, celebrating Dick and honoring, honoring his years of service to this uh, community and congregation. Um, that's all I have. There's a ton of other stuff. We have a new newsletter coming out next week, and we have uh, a whole panoply of speakers every Sunday, as well as uh, seven cultural events, as well music um, and poetry and and storytelling. So check out that newsletter and check out if you're interested. Uh, be in touch with us. We'll add you to our email list. And let's uh, come back with with Beatrice Green for another number. Thank you, Beatrice. The first piece that I played. Um, I saw the people with the drumming in front of Trinity and in the Christian tradition it's Palm Sunday and so I wanted to remember the people in Gaza and the innocent Jesus um, and that was why I played that particular piece. Um, the next piece is a spiritual uh, way in the water. You've probably heard it before. Um, God's going to trouble the water.
Beautiful Beatrice, thank you so much. We are so excited to welcome Professor Gerald Horn to our midst, and I hope this is just a, a, a introductory invitation for you to come join us in person sometime here in Boston. Whenever you're anywhere near, we'd love to host you here in our auditorium, but uh, for now, virtually, we'll do just fine. Um, we, we just um, look up to you so much. Uh, I've, I've watched uh, a bunch of your uh, work online, and, and it's just remarkable to hear this voice um, uh, of Professor Horn, um, who is the Moore's Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. Um, Professor Horn is the author of numerous books, including W.E.B. Du Bois, a biography, which um, uh, reminds me uh, that we have this incredible history with Du Bois, who spoke here numerous times, the last time, 1959. Other books by Professor Horn are Paul Robeson, The Artist as Revolutionary, wow, The Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism, The Roots of Slavery, White Supremacy, and Capitalism in the 17th Century, North America and the Caribbean, and many other books as well. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Gerald Horn. Thank you for inviting me. I certainly appreciate it. So this morning, what I plan to do is try to compare the events that have unfolded since October 7th, 2023 in historic Palestine to an analogous situation in 1956, oftentimes denoted as the Suez Crisis in terms of the impact of both 2023, 2024, and 1956, the impact on global and domestic affairs. Uh, first, I will discuss briefly 1956 in the aforementioned context, the bulk of my remarks will focus on October 7th and its aftermath in a similar context. And if I have time, I will talk about what is different. That is to say, the analysis that has come from the US left in particular of Israel as a settler colonial regime leads unavoidably and inevitably to seeing its patron, speaking of the United States, in a similar context. And seeing the United States in a similar context also points to the essence of settler colonialism, which involves class collaboration, which in turn helps to shed light on the Trump phenomenon, the rise of right-wing populism in the United States, and perhaps, as shall be discussed, an incipient fascism. And as suggested, if I have time, I will venture into the weeds of US history to provide further context for my remarks. Now, to 1956, Britain, France, and the Israel attacked the Egypt of G.A. Nasser for, in part, control of the Suez Canal, and in part, because of Egypt's role as a supporter of liberation movements on the African continent, particularly in Kenya, to the Southeast in Algeria, to the West. Uh, President Eisenhower 
of the United States intervened, as did the then Soviet Union, and as a direct result of the collapse of this proposed coup against Nasser, uh, Britain moves closer to the United States, tying its apron strings closer to the US, while France, accelerating a previous trend, seeks to develop independently, something that is unfolding as we speak, as I shall allude to shortly. This French trend was accelerated further when then Senator John Kennedy sought to undermine French rule in Algeria, uh, which did not end until 1962. And of course, uh, to that point was seen as a part of France, just as Hawaii is seen as a part of the United States. Actually, Eisenhower pulling the rug out from under Israel, Britain, and France can be seen in the cold light of history as the United States ratifying presently, presently the new stage of neocolonialism and away from bare knuckles colonialism. In other words, Washington stole a march on London and Paris, which still maintained colonial empires in Africa in particular, which did not begin to crumble until 1957 with Ghana, then 1960, the year of Africa, 1963, the year of Kenyan uh, independence. And so by pulling the rug out from under these European powers, uh, the United States had positioned itself to take advantage of the independence of these newly emerging African states. However, uh, President Eisenhower's action in 1956 provides context for the clumsily worded United Nations resolution uh, just uh, submitted and voted down a few days ago. Uh, that is to say, a U.S. resolution on a ceasefire uh, in Gaza, vetoed by Russia and China and also rejected by Algeria, which, by the way, has become increasingly militant on this front since October 7th, while Guyana also did not support this U.S. resolution. President Eisenhower's action in 1956 suggests that we have yet to hear the last of U.S. action on a ceasefire in 2024 or, heaven forbid, 2025, particularly as shall be seen given the pressure from the United States grassroots, including of late the United Auto Workers. Simultaneously in 1956, Another erstwhile Bostonian, speaking of the man once known as Malcolm X, uh, led the Nation of Islam away from its previous reliance upon Japan, as embodied in the now somewhat uh, elliptical idea of the Asiatic Black man, and towards Egypt and Africa. The decline of the left, particularly the Black left, in the midst of the Red Scare in the 1950s, contributes to the uh, accelerated rise of this kind of Black nationalism, just as the simultaneous assault on left-wing labor, such as the West Coast Longshore led by Australian-American Harry Bridges, also led to the acceleration of right-wing populist trends embodied in subsequent decades by Albert Schenker of the Teachers Union, and yet to be extinguished to this very day. Uh, there were other important events of 1956 that also are worth mentioning. Uh, foremost, perhaps, is the devaluation of Soviet leader Stalin by Nikita Khrushchev, and that, along with the 1953 execution of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, the so-called purported alleged atomic spies on behalf of Moscow, helped to contribute to an exodus, especially of Jewish Americans, from the U.S. Communist Party, and more so towards nationalism and Zionism. 
the devaluation also marks the acceleration, if not the onset of the rift between the then Soviet Union and China with monumental consequences for the small planet, just as the reconciliation of Moscow and Beijing today has similar consequence. Hungary also plays a role given its eruption in 1956, and it would not be outlandish to suggest that that nation's current leader, Viktor Orban, a close comrade of Donald J. Trump, a visitor to Mar-a-Lago, a man who has uh, supped with the U.S. Republican right, uh, can be seen as a legacy of the 1956 unrest in Budapest. Today, of course, the U.S. left has yet to recover uh, from the Red Scare. Uh, one issue, of course, as suggested previously, is that the destabilization of gigantic figures such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson, as Jim Crow is being eroded, made Black participation in foreign policy a spotty and episodic at best, empowering within the Democratic Party to which Black Americans glum to uh, post the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, their spotty participation in foreign policy debates in the Democratic Party uh, led to the empowering of neoconservative figures like Victoria Nuland. And of course, uh, she's just resigned from the State Department, perhaps because she did not receive the second ranking position behind Anthony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State. Instead, it was handed to Kurt Campbell, whose specialty is China, and there might be a, an obvious signal there. Uh, given this Black American spottiness in terms of debating foreign policy, and given the concomitant rise of conservatism in the United States, uh, even so-called uh, liberal Zionists, such as Bill Ackman, who destabilized President Gay at Harvard, are fanning the flames of conservatism, strengthening this trend, making more ironic the fact that the organized left supported the formation of Israel in 1947-1948, including Du Bois and Robeson, whereas Zionism today, as Peter Beinart suggests in this morning's New York Times, is in the vanguard of leading a U.S. stampede to the right, uh, making more poignant the last book by former U.S. Secretary of State, late U.S. Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, entitled pungently, Fascism, A Warning. That is to say that the Israel-Palestine crisis today, in terms of monumental consequence, may be having a similar impact as the previous crisis of 1956. And of course, it is our job to tease out the consequences so that we will not be ambushed, or waylaid, or surprised by unfolding trends and developments. Now to October 7, 2023, we all know by now that there have been tens of thousands killed in Gaza with a related crisis unfolding on the West Bank as we speak. The International Court of Justice in a case brought by South Africa in a very important development that I'll allude to shortly, uh, found that there has been a plausible case for genocide uh, brought against uh, Israel by South Africa. In a recent speech in the halls of Congress, the ranking Jewish American legislator and elected official, Senator Chuck Schumer of New York and Brooklyn, singled out for castigation, the ultra-Orthodox in Israel, the Palestinian Authority, Hamas, and Netanyahu. Mr. Schumer's speech is revealing insofar as it can be interpreted on the one hand as 
pointing the finger of accusation at Israel for its role in jeopardizing the U.S.'s overall global position, uh, given the fact that Israel uh, has been spared vetoes of Security Council resolutions in recent months because of U.S. intervention, or alternatively, Mr. Schumer's speech can be viewed as akin to cosmetics, that is to say, firing the captain of the ship, speaking of Netanyahu, rather than changing the direction of the ship. However, Mr. Schumer is correct to suggest that support for Israel is increasingly not bipartisan. This is nothing new, as suggested by my previous remarks, and only represents an acceleration of pre-existing trends. For example, uh, Mr. Netanyahu coming to Washington, not at the invitation of President Obama or Secretary of State John Kerry, but at the invitation of the Republicans on Capitol Hill in order to denounce their nuclear accord, that is to say the Democrats' nuclear accord with Iran. And of course, we all know about these remarks Mr. Netanyahu just gave to the Republican caucus just a few days ago. Uh, Trump and Netanyahu, of course, represent an odd couple insofar as we know that Mr. Trump still bar harbors resentment towards Mr. Netanyahu for not endorsing his so-called Stop the Steal campaign beginning in November 2020. And the question we now have to ask ourselves is, will that previous peak of Mr. Trump override all else? Of course, what they have in common is support from powerful elements within the U.S. ruling elite, particularly the Zionist wing of the U.S. ruling elite, speaking more specifically of the Adelson family of Las Vegas casinos fame, and increasingly, I should say, of Macau casinos fame. Macau, of course, being a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China. And of course, they also have expanded into professional sports with an ownership stake in the Dallas Mavericks basketball team. Yet so-called non-conservative uh, Zionist billionaires, such as William Ackman, aforementioned, uh, have been in the forefront of campaigning against diversity, equity, and inclusion. And of course, this once more represents how this Israel issue and the question of Zionism is dragging the United States further and further to the right, which is a slap in the face to those like Du Bois, Robeson, and in fact, the international organized left, which supported the formation of the state of Israel in 1947, 1948, which of course is a issue we may want to revisit at some point. On the other hand, with reference to the grassroots pressure from the United States of America, we would be remiss if we ignored the votes in the Democratic Party primary for president, including the stunning 13% plus voting uncommitted in the Michigan primary, uh, similar votes in other uh, key states. Karl Rove, Bush's brain, as he was called, the campaign strategist for the Bush the lesser, Bush the son, in the Wall Street Journal just the other day, uh, listed Michigan as one of several seven battleground states. And given the concern, if not alienation, on the part of Arab Americans in that particular state, it is possible that that battleground state will be lost to the Democrats and Mr. Biden in November 2024. With regard to Israel, the news may be dire if you take seriously the words of the well-known analyst, Elon Pape, who suggests that we are at the beginning of the end, in the foothills, if you'd like, the beginning of the end 
of the entire Zionist project. Now, I know why he takes that point of view. If you look at Southern Israel, uh, since October 7th, a good deal of the Israeli population has been evacuated. A lot, a major port in Southern Israel has been denoted by a recent observer as akin to a ghost town with this beaches virtually deserted and its port basically emptied of incoming vessels. Uh, this is due to the militarized sanctions imposed by Ansar Allah of Yemen, uh, which has been assaulting ships trans traversing the Red Sea, uh, headed to the Suez Canal, to Israel, and which, by the way, has hampered Egypt, which has accumulated a handsome sum over the decades from tolls imposed upon ships going through that choke point. Northern Israel, and there's a recent article, once again, on the New York Times website that alludes, that alludes to this, is also um, on the verge of virtual abandonment given rocket thrusts from Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. I should also mention, of course, the fact that Israel has killed a number of Hezbollah militants in southern Lebanon, uh, which may in the long run uh, bring Lebanon and Israel once again to the brink of a sharper conflict. The last one in 2006 did not end well for Israel. Uh, since that time, uh, Hezbollah has accumulated even more rockets. And of course, we know that it is allied to what could well be called Israel's public enemy number one, speaking of Iran. The so-called Abraham Accords, painstakingly negotiated by the 45th U.S. president, uh, seem to be crumbling. Recall that this was a kind of de facto treaty involving Morocco and Bahrain and Sudan, which of course is now plunged, not unrelatedly, into one of the most bloody conflicts on our small planet. Israel's economy is also crumbling, dependent as the Israeli military is upon reserves. That is to say, forces who ordinarily are stocking grocery shelves or sitting in cubicles, but are now on the front lines of combat in Gaza, if not the West Bank. Just as Mr. Netanyahu raised eyebrows a few years ago when he came to Washington, not at the invitation of the U.S. administration, the Obama administration, in a parallel maneuver in the last few weeks, one of the key members of the so-called war cabinet, uh, speaking of Benny Gantz, was in Washington, D.C., uh, the Netanyahu forces were quite upset by this. They see this as part and parcel of what could be called the schumer biden plan of pulling the rug out from under Mr. Netanyahu himself. Simultaneously, you see that the Israeli lobby, uh, led by uh, APEC, uh, one of the most powerful lobbies in Washington, D.C., along with the nice National Rifle Association, is going after a number of members of Congress. Interestingly enough, uh, many of the members of Congress they're targeting are members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, speaking of Jamal Bowman of uh, Bronx Westchester, uh, Summer Lee of Western Pennsylvania, Andre Carson of Indiana, Corey Bush of St. Louis, Missouri, and of course, to that list might be added subsequently uh, Al Green of Houston, who, as Mr. Biden was landing in the Bayou City for a fundraiser, took out a full page ad in the local newspaper, implicitly criticizing uh, Mr. Biden's policy with regard uh, to uh, the crisis in Gaza and West Bank. 
at the same time, in a sense, thumbing its nose and belying the strategy of the Zionist wing of the U.S. ruling class, you have, in Houston at least, Nazis on the march, uh, marching under the banner of the so-called slogan of, quote, down with Jewish supremacy, unquote, at the same time, throughout Dixie, which is the heartbeat of the U.S. right, you have the proliferation of ally groups, such as the Blood Tribe in Tennessee, which has a similar political platform as the Nazis. And yet we see that the Israelis lobby is saving some of its most powerful punches for Jewish Voices for Peace, for If Not Now, for J Street, and other elements within the Jewish community that do not go along with their Netanyahu-like massacre and ICJ-denoted genocide in Gaza. As suggested, uh, this puts Washington in a very delicate position that is to say, trapped, bogged down in Israel, suffering reputational damage as a result of this so-called alliance, which is hampering its focus on Ukraine. Note here the linkage of aid to Israel and aid to Ukraine now bogged down in Congress. And of course, it is also hampering focus on the big enchilada, which is the People's Republic of China, and the rebel island that is Taiwan off the southern coast of China. Uh, speaking of reputational damage, you need look no further than the denunciation of Israel policies in Gaza by Brazil's Lula, which of course in return brought a sharp rebuke from the Israeli authorities, but Lula was not alone as President Petro of Colombia uh, spoke in similar, if not more harsh terms about what Israel is doing in Gaza. Also, an emblem of this reputational damage is the already noted South African case before the International Court of Justice concerning genocide by Israel in Gaza. Of course, every cloud has a silver lining, and I dare say that when you begin to look at recent U.S. foreign policy towards Southern Africa, the warming of relations with Angola, for example, the easing of sanctions with regard to South Africa's immediate northern neighbor, speaking of Zimbabwe, for example, that this is a reflection of Washington seeking to gain leverage against South Africa, particularly since this ICJ case raises implicitly, if not explicitly, a similar castigation of those who are aiding and abetting genocide, where we would have to look in the first instance towards the Pentagon, the State Department, and the White House. I don't think that the visit to Washington recently concluded by South Africa's foreign minister, Pandor, uh, helped to allay the growing tensions between Pretoria and Washington, which undoubtedly will receive, uh, will reach a fever pitch as South Africa approaches elections in May, the 30th anniversary of the first democratic elections in 1994 that brought Nelson Mandela to power. And I should also say, that South Africa-U.S. relations are not only being shaped by the ICJ case, but also by South Africa's ever closer ties to the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and of course the S for South Africa, with the recent addition of Egypt, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Iran. Israel is viewed by some as less than helpful to Washington on the Russian-Ukraine front. Recall that before the special military operation launched in February 2022, that Mr. Netanyahu was a regular visitor uh, to Moscow to the point 
where some thought perhaps he should rent an apartment there. There are credible allegations of Israel leaking U.S. advanced military technology to China. This development perhaps is causing U.S. allies to become even more adventurous when it comes to the all-important Ukraine front. Recall that France has threatened to put boots on the ground. Radoslaw Sikorsky of Poland, a prominent figure there, has said that it's a notorious and open secret that there are already NATO boots on the ground in Ukraine already. This, of course, recalls the admonition of then U.S. President Barack Obama, who cautioned against U.S. intervention in Ukraine because he said, his words, Russia had, quote, escalatory dominance in that region, which apparently is the case. Now, back to the U.S. of A. Uh, despite the Balfour Declaration uh, circa 100 or odd years ago, coming from Britain, promising a Jewish homeland in historic Palestine, it's important to note that the United States of America has been critical to this larger story, not only in being one of the first states to recognize Israel, but also if you look at the historic relationship between the United States and the Jewish diaspora. In my book, the dawning of the apocalypse, which deals with the 16th century, I asked the basic question, how did London prevail north of Florida over Spanish, which after over the Spanish, which after all, at the first mover's advantage, insofar as they sponsored Christopher Columbus in 1492, I point to a number of turning points, 1517, with Martin Luther's secession from the Vatican, the Catholic Church, and the rise of the Protestant faith in London, which ignites a round robin of religious conflict between Protestant and Catholics. London, which expelled this Jewish population at the end of the 13th century, was under siege by the 1500s. For example, witness the fact that in 1588, uh, Spain only barely avoided uh, defeating and seizing on London itself during that pivotal year. And so London under siege reversed course and began to embrace the Jewish diaspora. This of course was part and parcel of the beginning of the settler colonial project in North America in what was called North Carolina in the 1580s, whereby a diverse a conglomeration agglomeration of English and Irish and Scots of various class backgrounds, sponsored by the 1% in London, uh, transported themselves across the Atlantic in order to dispossess the indigenous population. And this leads inevitably uh, to the construction of this militarized and monetized identity that we know today as whiteness, which is still with us, that is to say, those who had been warring on the shores of Europe, English versus Irish, English versus Scots, British versus German, German versus Pole, Pole versus Russian, Serb versus Croat, Northern Italian versus Southern Italian, of course, Protestants versus Catholics. All of a sudden, when they cross the Atlantic, they assume this new identity, that is to say, whiteness, which involves class collaboration, which inherits in settler colonialism. And that class collaboration was necessary to effectuate the goals of seizing the land of the indigenous and then corralling the enslaved Africans who then began to build these settlements. Of course, this construction of whiteness was eventually expanded even beyond the shores of Europe. Uh, for example, on your morning TV, uh, you were greeted by the comrade of Jenna Bush, the daughter of Bush the Lesser, speaking of Hoda Kotb, who is of Egyptian descent, but in the popular imagination, it's constructed as, quote, white, unquote, a ditto for those of Lebanese descent, uh, such as Ralph Nader. Thus, you saw the Jewish diaspora was integrated with others, 
uh, into whiteness and even into the U.S. ruling class, as evidenced by my previous references to Ackman and the Edelmans, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, in this context, recall the remarks of then Senator uh, Joseph Biden, who spoke of Israel as a state that we would have to invent. That is to say, Washington would have to invent if it didn't exist as a kind of unsinkable aircraft carrier. Uh, one of the eras of the US left, of, of a number of eras that I could el elaborate upon, was seeing this integration of those who had been despised in Europe, Catholics, Jewish diaspora, et cetera, as somehow being a president for the integration of those of African descent into various levels of US society, not paying careful and close attention to the history, would suggest that this integration of others of European ancestry and non-European ancestry was actually designed precisely to, <laughs> to ensure that uh, that particular integration of Black Americans or even Native Americans would not take place. In any case, there has been a lot of scholarship on that that I could elaborate upon, but for those who doubt the thrust of that analysis, you need look no further then January 6, 2021, uh, when you had the attempted uh, destruction of the peaceful of the peaceful transfer of power from one party to another, effectuated by once again a diverse agglomeration conglomeration of class elements, including CEOs flying in on airplanes, shopkeepers, military veterans, working class elements, although disproportionately they hail from Dixie. So where does that leave us? I think where it leaves us, number one, is sharpening our analysis of how we reach this perilous point when we have to pay careful and close attention to the last book of Madeleine Albright speaking of fascism of mourning. Uh, secondly, uh, we must buttress and bolster those forces who have been in the forefront of protests of these disturbing trends uh, speaking of United Auto Workers, Jewish Voices for Peace, if not now, et cetera. And as my remarks suggest, uh, we need uh, a similar trend as represented by the United Auto Workers to be spreading not only through the entire labor movement, but perhaps uh, spreading into a wider Black community, uh, which has been suffering incessantly, despite the fact that on May 17, 2024, we'll be marking the 70th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education, which some had thought was the beginning of the end of said suffering. So I will stop here and thank you for your attention. Professor Horn, thank you so much for joining us. And again, this is an invitation for you to come and visit us in person anytime you are near here. Uh, and we, we really just uh, welcome your wisdom and your, your input here. Um, this is the moment that I tell you that we need you, oh congregation, oh um, uh, viewers, oh um, uh, cyber, uh, cyber chasers uh, to help us make these programs uh, move forward. Um, there is a um, website, communitychurchofboston.org, that has a way for you to donate through a credit card or a PayPal. In the back of the room here, there is also a basket that will take cash or checks. Uh, let's see, do we accept any other forms of, of payment? Uh, I don't think we have Venmo or crypto anything, uh, but, but we'll work on that um, next time, maybe. Um, let's, uh, let's thank, again, Beatrice Green for, for beautifying our program this morning. Um, once again, Beatrice Green. The 
next piece I, th I think I'm going to play. <laughs> Sometimes I, I prepare more than I'm actually going to play. Um, there was a movement that started in Egypt, and then we had Occupy. And I just want us to remember the strength of those movements coming together. Um, because we need a movement like that, as Professor Horn had alluded to.
Thank you, Beatrice. Beautiful harmonies, beautiful rhythms. Um, I want to also just remember Rachel Corey. It was uh, eight, March 21st, 21 years ago, that, that Rachel was killed by a bulldozer in Rafa. Um, we remember you, Rachel, and we shout out, we send our greetings to Rachel's parents who live in Olympia, Washington, and who have basically dedicated their, their whole lives to, to um, reversing the, the, the horrific thing that is Zionism. And um, uh, there's just too many martyrs. There's Romero, there's Rachel. There's Aaron Bushnell right behind here. But I also want to send out a, a, a wonderful um, thank you to Larry Wilkerson. And uh, some of you were here for his talk. It was, it was just wonderful having Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson with us in person, live. Um, uh, he was just uh, such a sweet man. and. Um, and so generous, um, and his his YouTube talk, which I invite you all to go to go check out, has garnered about forty thousand views or something like that. And, and and we put another excerpt that immediately had thousands of views. It, it's it, he's he's just another uh, wonderful, amazing prophetic voice that we have uh, on our YouTube channel, and are so proud of that. Um, we have a uh, chance to, to talk to Professor Horn a little bit, and uh, we're going to start with, with our um, Zoom Meister and, and tech uh, support um, all around um, mensch, Amar Ahmad. Um, go ahead, Amar. Oh, bring you the mic, yes. Thank you, Dean, and uh, thank you, Beatrice, for that really uh, great music, and thank you, Professor Horn, for your uh, very uh, insightful talk. My question for you is, um, I'm, I'm wondering, how do you think this conflict in Gaza is likely to end? Huh. Well, unfortunately, my crystal ball is in mothballs, so I'm not able to give you a definitive response, but given the increasing global pressure and concomitant domestic pressure in the United States, it's going to be very difficult for the Netanyahu regime to resist, despite the fact that apparently he has a substantial percentage, at least of Jewish Israelis, behind him. Uh, however, I think that the clumsily worded United States resolution on a ceasefire just vetoed hopefully can be reworded. And with that already referenced rising global and domestic pressure can then impose a ceasefire on the parties. There is this notion that's been floated by Tom Friedman in the New York Times that uh, after the ceasefire, that then work can begin on building bridges to the Saudis and to the Gulf Arabs, and then with a Israeli regime pledging to move forward on the two-state solution that will lead to the reconstruction of Gaza. The, the spanner in the works, as I see it, is that it's difficult to see the Israeli populace in their present mood, that is to say the Jewish Israeli populace, and their present mood of ceding to this uh, much discussed two-state solution. Uh, in the long run, of course, there has been discussion, including in the previously referenced article by Peter Beinert in the New York Times this morning about a binational state, a Jewish, Arab, Palestinian state that could take various forms. Uh, Realistically speaking, it's difficult for me to see the Zionist lobby, which still 
retains enormous strength, as noted in the United States, nor their Israeli comrades accepting that binational state. So I'm just laying out factors. I'm not sure if I can prognosticate what the end result will be. So next question, Professor Horn, I, I wonder if you might tell us a little bit more. You started with 1956, and I've heard, uh, but I don't know much about um, what happened in Gaza at that, at that point. Um, I've, I've heard just snippets about horrific um, uh, massacres of men in, in Gaza. Do you know about that? That's my first question. Um, and then the, the other thing is, is uh, there's, there's all this doom saying about Israel, and you mentioned the, the, uh, the south and the north being sort of depopulated. Miko Paled recently talked about um, uh, lots and lots of Israelis looking for, for passports in other countries. Um, but at the same time, you have this, uh, this Israeli population that overwhelmingly supports what's going on with with Israel's actions against Gaza, and and that uh, really portends really badly for for the 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 future of uh, of and and doesn't doesn't suggest that it's something that's about to go away. Um, what, what do you what do you think about those two things? Well, my understanding is that there have been thousands of Israelis post October seventh who have decided to migrate. And of course, an increasing number will be coming to these shores. And that reminds me of the movie Munich, which actually I would recommend. It's a Steven Spielberg movie uh, detailing the Israeli response to what happened in the wake of killings of Israeli nationals at the 1972 Olympics. And of course, the film ends with some of the heroes of Israel winding up in New York City. And as I recall, the last scene of, of that movie is the Israeli heroes who had moved to New York City in a shot framed in the background by the then existing Twin Towers, which as you know, came down in a heap on September 11th, 2001. So the problem with that kind of migration is that it likely diminishes whatever pro-settlement, I mean, settlement in the sense of settling the, the conflict as opposed to <laughs> settlements on the West Bank. It reduces the pro-settlement core of the Israeli population, which actually needs bolstering and strengthening. And certainly uh, in 1956, as in 1947, 1948, and prior to that, and of course after that, uh, there have been rather significant uh, massacres of Palestinians. Although it's, it's fair to suggest that in some ways, uh, Gaza has been the hard core of Palestinian resistance. Uh, it's no accident, as historians like to say, that, his, that the Israelis were forced to pack up and leave their settlements in Gaza in the last decade or so, at the same time that settlements on the West Bank were expanding and escalating. Even today, with this rather vitriolic uh, Israeli sentiment that we both made reference to, there is little talk about reestablishing settlements. There have been talks, of course, in Israel about uh, a post-Hamas Gaza. Uh, there has been talk about expelling the Gazan population into the Sinai Desert. There has been talk about uh, having Gaza descend into something equivalent to what we now see in Haiti. Uh, that is to say, with regard to paramilitary forces running amok 
which would then give Israel a further excuse to suggest, well, you don't expect us to negotiate with them, do you? So I hate to be seemingly a bearer of doom and gloom, but at the same time, we must be realistic about what's going on there. We must be realistic about the history that led us to this point and not uh, proffer the easy and simplistic remedies and solutions mm -hmm. for a conflict that has unwound for decades. Uh, Go ahead, Alan. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Yesterday, I was thinking about the complicity of citizens in different cases. In Germany, the majority of the Germans were complicit of the regime. In South Africa, almost every white was complicit of apartheid. And I don't hesitate to say that the overwhelming majority of the Jewish people in Israel are complicit of this genocide. And that's something that I'm saying very open, despite the comments that I'm saying anti-Semitic anti -Semitic statements. But I don't fear that, because that is a fact. The second thing that you mentioned, which is very interesting, about the American empire, is that the immigrants like myself who come here, many of them are tempted to be assimilated to white supremacy or white um, whatever. And if I can do something in the time that I have left on this earth, is to convince the Latino community, not to convince the community, a few friends of mine at least, to have the torch and the candles and the light to say, hey, we don't need to Americanize ourselves as whites wants us to Americanize. Thank you. These are my comments. I'm not sure if, if that should be greeted with a response. Perhaps we should reserve our time for other comments and questions. But if, if you want me to, I can respond. Yeah. Sure, Professor, go ahead. Okay, with, with regard to the first point, uh, it's something that echoes what I've said. But in the history of settler colonialism, including settler colonialism in North America, a lot of the recent scholarship, which I did not have time to address, suggests that in terms of profound changes in the political and economic landscape, the abolition of slavery, for example, that it was driven in no small measure by external events. The Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, I addressed this in a book and its impact on the United States of America, if you want to reference it, and the allied rise of British abolitionism, driven in no small measure by the Haitian Revolution, as that revolt against enslavement had knock-on effects in the cash cows of London, of Jamaica, and Barbados in particular, unleashing a chain of events that led to the abolition of slavery in the United States of America. And of course, I alluded to the erosion of Jim Crow, U.S. apartheid in the 1950s. Uh, that is to say, this was driven in no small measure by the fact that Washington found it difficult to compete for hearts and minds with the Soviet Union and the socialist camp as long as national liberation movements in Caribbean and Africa were on the march. This creates a dynamic uh, leading to May 17, 1954, the judicial overthrow of U.S. apartheid. But of course, the price was heavy, the tossing overboard of our most seasoned and internationalist leaders led by Paul Robeson and W.E.B. Du Bois. With regard to your second point, the point is well taken. Uh, 
And I, I think that the assimilation of many, or I should say some, uh, immigrants into white supremacy is quite unnerving and chilling. I recall, for example, speaking in Houston about uh, seven years ago at a pro-Palestinian rally where I gave what I thought to be antiseptic and anodyne remarks about solidarity between Black Americans and Palestinians. Uh, we're both suffering under settler colonialism, blah, blah, blah. And a line of I, Palestinians, and I guess Palestinian Americans lined up, including a, a noted academic, to rebuff me, I guess, because they were, you know, they're, since they're melanin deficient, they're not necessarily followed in department stores. Or, and of course, not being uh, products of that naughty contradiction of enslavement in North America. And they're not necessarily perceived, at least visually, as enemies of the state. So this is, is a hurdle that we have to overcome, and it is that context that I welcome your words. Um, I am thinking that you mentioned the New York Times a few times, and I've been having trouble to read the New York Times or any of the main media from the United States and also from Brazil, where I come from. One of the um, newspapers that I'm still reading is The Guardian, which two days ago came with this headlight saying that the Republican House Speaker says he will invite Netanyahu to address Congress. And it says Michael Johnson says it would be a great honor for Israel's Prime Minister to speak as Republican support remains strong despite death toll in Gaza rising. And so if you don't mind to make a comment about the me mass media, especially the New York Times covering the war on Gaza, and also if we are um, making the Republicans the only evil again, and the um, elections are coming fast. I have a few so-called liberal progressive friends that say that's the reason we have to vote for the Democrats again. So what are your views on this mass media movement, um, the villainizing, um, the genocide in Gaza, and also how to react to those comments. If you don't vote for the Democrats or Biden, you are electing Trump, you're voting for Trump, and therefore you're saying that Netanyahu is welcome in the United States. And by the way, if Netanyahu is really coming, should we do another march to Washington? Thank you. Yes, if Netanyahu comes to Washington, we should definitely be in the streets, not only in Washington, but in Boston. Uh, second of all, with regard to the New York Times and other organs of the mass media, including the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, et cetera, uh, I think my position is that in order to keep up with what's going on, in, in the United States, even if you view these organs as mouthpieces of the U.S. ruling class, well, you have to know what the U.S. ruling class is thinking. Um, of course, you need to supplement that with other sources, such as Pacifica Radio, of which I am a part, in the interest of full disclosure, Granma of Cuba, Asia Times Online, China Daily, uh, the list is long the Herald of Zimbabwe. I mean, there are many organs that, that one can subscribe to. And keep in mind that as capitalist enterprises, the New York Times, uh, they cannot ignore altogether a sector of the U.S. body politic that is sympathetic to the views that I hold. And so therefore, they must, in some sense, carry articles and news that will cause people like me to pay money to get access to these articles and views. 
So my own estimate is that if one wants to be fully informed, one needs a broad diet of news sources, or even more effectively, one needs to be part of a collective that then shares this survey of various uh, organs. With regard to November 2024, I think that some of your friends need to study the U.S. Electoral College. That is to say, in a U.S. presidential election, the person who gets the most votes does not necessarily prevail, as Hillary Rodham Clinton and Al Gore could well attest. The U.S. presidential election is 50 plus different elections. And in my remarks, you might recall that I made reference to an article by Karl Rove in the Wall Street Journal of all places. And of course, I read the Wall Street Journal, even though it's the House organ of the Republican Party. Uh, Karl Rove referred to only seven states at play. He did not include Massachusetts being at play. And so if you are in the base state, you have more flexibility in terms of how you cast your ballot. If you're in the state of Texas, where I'm sitting, you have more flexibility. So you should acquaint your friends in Beantown with what I've just articulated. Yes, uh, we have a question online from Patricia. Are you there, Patricia? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, I'm I'm calling in from California, actually. So, um, welcome. My question: the thing that I'm a little bit surprised about is um, how the Black and Latino community hasn't really rallied together for Palestine as extensively as I thought they would. Um, even in California, I mean, there's a lot. I'm in a location where there's lots of Latinos. And it's a very deep split. I mean, some of them are for Palestine because they, they equate it to what's happening at the border and in their countries, because a lot of them are uh, undocumented. But the people who have been um, basically what I call uh, integrated into the um, uh, culture, let's say California culture, they almost don't, they just don't even, it doesn't, so it isn't anything that even crosses their mind. And even in some of the, I've been working in with some uh, things in the black community in East Oakland as well. It's like, well, that's happening over there. And they don't see the connection of what ha what's happening over there to what, ha what could happen here, you know? So I'm wondering what your perspective is on how we could gain a more unified, um, uh, movement of unifying more, I mean, Black and Latino and people of color organizations to create a more massive organization. Because right now, Biden is cherry picking the Black community. He's cherry picking the Latino community. You know, it took, it took how many months did it take for even the Black caucus to say anything about what was happening in Palestine with the murder of children? It took a long, long time. Our senator, who's a Latino, who boasts that he covers, uh, that he cares about uh, people at the border, has yet, Alex Padilla has yet to call for a ceasefire. Even though La Panza Butler, who's a, a, you know, a sit-in for Dianne Feinstein, finally called for a ceasefire. So I want to hear your thoughts on that. Well, my thoughts are simple. Uh, number one, I think that these are beleaguered communities that you're making reference to, uh -huh. many of whom are facing a crisis of everyday living. And number two, if you examine my remarks since I began speaking, you would inevitably be, I'm sure, taken by my analysis of black organizational structure over the past 70 odd years, where to repeat, you had a Faustian bargain of sorts effectuated, whereby in return for a hesitating and agonizing retreat from the more horrible aspects of US apartheid and Jim Crow, the trade-off was throwing overboard the most internationalist leaders, such as Du Bois and Robeson to repeat for the fourth time. And this, is not something that can be easily dismissed and easily swept under the rug. 
And so in a number of remarks and speeches and lectures that I've been given in recent months and years, I've been urging the NAACP, which is the largest mass organization and should be in the vanguard of, of this crisis, but is not to apologize to the Du Bois family, the Robeson family, as a way to repair the breach, because I think that until we get that particular mass organization to move effectively, it's going to be difficult for the US progressive movement as a whole to move in a progressive direction. Although uh, you probably know that the AME church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, has been in the forefront of uh, calling for a ceasefire, and that may be a prelude to the NAACP doing so, so, doing so, and many of the Black people in Oakland who you're consorting with are undoubtedly members of the AME Church. And so even if they're not speaking in their own voice, the body to which they give offerings every Sunday is speaking for them. And I would also make this very important, profound point, which is that if the United States is truly moving to the right, if Mr. Trump is truly ahead in the polls, as we are often told, if we are on the verge of fascism, as suggested by the book I referenced by the late Madeleine Albright, well then you can expect many people to try to cut a deal, to try to save their hides. And so yeah. it all comes back to, once again, the settler population. The Euro-American working class, the Euro-American middle class, when are they going to wake up? Interestingly enough, I, I'm reluctant to quote the New York Times again, since <laughs> there was implicit criticism of it. But if you look at the New York Times letters column this morning, there is a reaction right. to a column by their columnist, uh, Paul Krugman, on the roots of rural white rage. And everybody's giving a, a sort of, um, all the letter writers are telling why People defined as white in rural communities are so upset. Fair enough. But they all beg the question of, of if they're so upset, why are they voting for Trump? I yeah, mean, I, I agree mean, with you. Yeah. Somebody needs to address that. And if you address that and do something by, by, about that, I can assure you that beleaguered Black and Latino communities uh, will not be far behind. Well, maybe we need to do some sort of outreach to them. I've always talked to some of our um, uh, community groups here in the Bay Area saying, rather than demon, uh, demonizing these rural uh, people in, in the rural areas, we need to engage them and educate them. Because I went up, actually during COVID, I was in one of the most whitest, Trumpist areas. It's called Mount Shasta. It's like got a big dichotomy. It's between spiritual people and Trumpsters. And it was it was when Trump was running, it was like Trump with flags and people with guns and all sorts of stuff. But as I started talking to some of the people in a very, you know, uh, in a very logical way with them, asking them, you know, well, would you want this or would you want this in your community? Do you understand what he's saying? When they were actually started listening, they said, well, no, you know, we like our Latino people here. We have like really good Mexican restaurants. We have really good relationships with our Latino uh, um, you know, workers here. We really like them. They're so work. They work. They have really good ethics. They're nice. No, we wouldn't want to see that happening at the border. So you see what I'm saying? It's almost like I think you're right. What you're saying is that the media tends to overcover with these bombastic um, things, and the people read that stuff, and that's their that's how that's their their food for for the morning breakfast. They never ever meet with people like yourself or myself or other groups that could sit down and say, hey, this is what really is going on. It's not that there's that you're any different than we are. We all have pretty much, you know, we have some values that we share in common. Maybe there's something we need to look at and how we're being, uh, the food we're being fed every day and to see if maybe we're being poisoned instead of giving getting nutrition, we're being poisoned to, to separate us all so that a few people could have the power that they want and control the rest of the country through, you know, whatever means money, power, whatever they're doing, corporations, whatever, at your expense and your children's expense. And I think by those types of conversations, if we could figure out a way to mobilize to go out to the rural areas, that would be great. The only problem we have now is that we have two bad candidates. We have a Trump and we have a Biden. 
we need a third candidate. And why haven't we pushed for a third candidate somehow? We got to find somebody to replace Biden and Trump. Somebody's got to be in the middle there. Otherwise, they have, they're have they going to pick somebody. And if you don't vote by default, somebody's going to get be the president. It may not be. Neither one of them are very good. So we have, we're sort of like in a dilemma because we have no third alternative that I can see that the mass amount of people would vote for or enough to displace the other two. So anyway, that's, that's, you know, that's sort of my frustration because I will vote for neither. Here's another um, concern, uh, Professor Horn, just the, um, uh, the, What's happening in academia, the, 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 the campus situation with, with uh, lots of groups defunded, the uh, Students for Justice in Palestine professors um, canceled, uh, Claudine Gay canceled, uh, just because of pressure from, uh, from big money supporters. Uh, I wonder if uh, I might ask what, how that, if that is has affected you or, or some of your colleagues, um, and it's, it's, what it's like trying to, to, have free expression on campus. In Texas. In Texas. Well, Texas, as you know, is the self-described shining buckle of the Bible Belt so to speak. Uh, I think in my book, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the, and the Roots of U.S. Fascism, I suggested that those who are interested in changing the United States need to focus on Texas because Texas is to the United States as the United States is to the world. That is to say, just as the United States drags the international community to the right as reference with regard to the United Nations, Texas, Ted Cruz, Greg Abbott, the debacle on the border, et cetera, drags the United States to the right. Now, as for myself personally, I haven't been in the classroom since 2020. Uh, I've been focused on research and writing, although I'm not sure how long that can last. And once again, for those of us who follow the news, whatever source you may rely upon, uh, you should pay careful and close attention to the articles about the recent legislation in the state of Indiana which suggests that historians like myself have to bring in diverse points of view. Now, I guess if I'm talking about slavery, I have to bring in pro-slavery uh, points of view in order to avoid being fired, because that's the ultimate sanction that is on offer in the state of Indiana. This is a reflection of the fact, once again, that uh, the United States and the ruling elite in the United States had to make certain concessions uh, during the Cold War when there was in a battle of ideas with the then socialist camp where they were pointing the finger of accusation saying they're squashing free speech. The United States is the bastion of free speech. Well, now, of course, the gloves are off. Campuses are seen as sort of the last sanctuary of free thinking, a refuge for so-called tenured radicals that needs to be purged sooner rather than later. And so that legislation in Indiana, I'm sure, will be replicated in Texas, perhaps duplicated elsewhere. If Trump returns to the White House in January 2025, uh, you will probably see something even worse, even in the self-described Athens of North America, speaking of your own Boston. Go ahead. Hello, uh, Professor uh, Steve Patterson. Um, because I live in Massachusetts in the 2020 and, and 2022 election, I, I work to um, um, uh, register people to vote in Georgia. Um, and I'm not going to do it this year because I can't imagine having uh, a conversation with a, uh, with a black, black person vote Biden. Um, uh, there's no question that the reason that the Democrats have control of the Senate is because of the outpouring of votes of, of, of the uh, black voters in, 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 in Georgia. Um, 
something like um, Palestine could bring the despair that, keep, that, that keeps people home. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering in the political ca calculus if, if that's even being thought of in, in terms of this next election. I'm not sure I understand. Could you elaborate? I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, uh, you know, people either vote for a reason or don't vote vote because of despair. Um, and um, there were a lot of people in Georgia that had had good reasons to 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 to, to vote. Um, and I think in in the colonial colonial identity of both. Uh, Black Americans and Palestinians, uh, there, there has to be some recognition uh, be, uh, between the between the two, and could that drive down the Democratic vote in the coming election? Well, if you believe the polls, and of course we have to be skeptical of the polls because they've gotten so many things wrong in recent elections, but if you believe the polls. Uh, there is a fair amount of alienation. I've already alluded to it in the state of Michigan with regard to Arab Americans, for example. There is a certain disappointment uh, with regard to what Biden has accomplished or not accomplished vis-a-vis uh, -vis black Americans. So if your question is, may that have an impact on turnout? I think the answer is yes. And certainly, once again, to reiterate, if it does appear that Mr. Trump, who, let's be clear, receives a disproportionate percentage of the electoral, electorate's vote that is defined as, quote, white, unquote, uh, if it seems that he's returning to the White House, well, obviously, people will try to cut deals or be further plunged into despair and perhaps not vote at all. I, I, I never, you know, people in the United States are, are oftentimes dangerously ignorant of their own history. Uh, let me point out, for example, that in 1991, a Klansman and a Nazi, David Duke, running for governor of the state of Louisiana, received 50% plus of the Euro American vote, the vote defined as, quote, white, unquote, across class lines. It took a massive turnout from the black population to nip his gubernatorial chances in the bud. I mean, I could go on in this vein of bringing out the rather disturbing aspects of the not so distant history of US electoral politics, but I'll stop here in the interest of time. Okay. We'll stop here in the interest of lunch, <laughs> which is uh, on its way down. Um, though I, I, I'm so sorry that the 500 people who have um, viewed on YouTube and the, and the 40 who are uh, on the Zoom can't join us for lunch because there's pupusas and there's tamales and there's gallo pinto. It's, it's quite a feast uh, about to happen here. Um, uh, but uh, first, I, I just want to tell you uh, uh, one more thing. I mentioned April Fool's Day, April 1st, Jimmy Tingle. April 2nd, we have a magnificent program, a, quint a vocal quintet called Kulomba. They, uh, they play international um, choral music from a lot of places like uh, the country Georgia or like Corsica or like the Appalachians of the United States, uh, and also a, a wonderful classical repertoire. Uh, April 2nd, Kulomba, C-U-L-O-M-B-A. Um, that, that's going to be a really well-attended concert. We also already have a bunch of reservations. And lots of other cultural events and, and magnificent speakers. Um, Gerald Horn, we want to thank you again for being with us. Uh, we plan to uh, acquire a number of your your amazing sounding books and get you here physically one of these days to sign them for us and add to our our library here at community church um, and thank you all in in the room for for joining us today and uh let's uh call it 
call it lunch. Uh, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next Sunday for Audrey Shulman. I'm signing off. Thank you. We'll be in touch. <laughs>